session number five of our Praying Men of the Bible, focusing on the New Testament portion of Scripture. Uh, Last week, we talked about the prayers of Paul, and we started with part one of this three-part series in the midst of this eight-part teaching. And last week, we started with the apostolic prayers of Paul, and we dealt with four of those found in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And we talked about how the apostolic prayers are God-centered and addressed to God and not the devil. Uh, God-centered prayer, including spiritual warfare prayer, is the model of the New Testament. We also talked about how apostolic prayers are positive prayers, asking God for the impartation of positive things instead of the removal of negative things. Because sometimes we tend to focus on the negative more than what God is actually doing. And positive praying, when we do that, especially in a corporate setting, like in a church meeting or gathering, prayer meeting, brings unity. That positive prayer brings unity to the church. And God knows us so well that it even begins to heal the negative parts of our heart that have been affected by prayer that we've done the wrong way or in the wrong attitude or spirit. Number three from last week's life lessons is that apostolic prayers are for the church. They focus our intercession on a greater measure of the Holy Spirit being released and a greater measure of justice being released. And we also ended our time, which I thought was so timely. You know, I I don't know a lot of times what pastor's preaching ahead of time. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm teaching on ahead of time. But I thought this lined up so beautifully that apostolic prayers usually ride along three themes of the praying for the fruit or character of God in someone's life, praying the wisdom of God over someone's life, and praying the gifts of God to be released in someone's life. And those three things just fit beautifully with pastor's uh, message on beginning to pray and contending for our children in prayer. So just wanted to remind you of that. That was part one. Tonight we're going to focus on the prayers of Paul that are found in the book of Romans and in Thessalonians. So you'll see that in your notes, Praying Men of the Bible, number five, The Prayers of Paul. This is part two of this part three series. There's a quote by Reverend J.H. Jowett I want to read, first of all. And let me just say this about this quote. If if you're not careful, you can be critical of what he's saying uh, because we tend to um, defend the underdog, so to speak, We kind of come to the aid of the person that we feel is being put down. I'll explain what that means in just a moment. But this is his quote. He's talking about William Law has this very pertinent word in his devout life. It was a book that he wrote about devotional life with the Lord. And he said, quoting the book, Devout Life, when you begin your petitions, use such various expressions of the attributes of God as may make you most sensible of the greatness and power of the divine nature. And then William Law gives various examples. And then this is Reverend J.H. Howitt saying what he feels about that, which I am bound to say would not be helpful to me as they would imprison my spirit in a coat of mail. But, and there's a big but there, I want to emphasize and commend the principle of it which is that our fellowship with the Lord should begin with the primary elements of adoration and praise. So basically, he was taking something he didn't fully agree with from another minister's writing, and he's saying, if I did it that way, my personality wouldn't line up with that, and that would rub me the wrong way. But I like what he's saying. Let's begin our time with fellowship with God, with adoration and praise. And I I love that. Think about the times when we come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, life group. Many times we begin our time together with worship and praise and adoration and thanksgiving. And I believe that that is a biblical principle. Why? Because it opens heaven and it opens our heart to the will and presence of God. And I know I'm spending a long time on this quote, but I just want to point out the importance of this. That's what these prayers do as well. They open us up to heaven. They open us up to the will of the Father. And we're putting his plans first. Not our plans, not our directives, not our strategies. We're saying, Lord, let what you desire come to pass 
before anything I ask to come to pass. So let's look at the scriptures tonight. There's five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's five of them we'll talk about tonight, starting in Romans. And this first prayer that Paul prayed in Romans 15, five through seven is prayer for unity in the church across a city or region. Prayer for unity in the church across a city or region. Here's the prayer. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been a part of a minister's group since about 2001 and we've had amazing things happen some pastors and churches have come and gone but there's still a little core group of pastors that have been meeting regularly to pray together to pray over the city to learn how to pastor the city together because one pastor can't pastor all of Columbia but pastors can come together and focus on regions that the Lord's placed them in. Again, God is missionary in purpose and strategic in placement. And so the first Wednesday of each month, I get together with these pastors and we pray over the St. Andrews area where most of our churches exist. Um, Jeff Shipman at Columbia Crossroads Church, um, Paul Cochran at Woodland Hills Community Church, Ryan Purs at uh, Trinity, let's see, Three Rivers Baptist Church on, uh, over in the Irmo area. There's like five or six of us that we meet once a month and we ask the Lord to show us how to pray for the city, to pray for the church as a whole, not just my church or my problems or your church or your issues, but our church, the church. And I love how when we talk to one another, we say there's one church in Columbia that meets at 2700 Bush River Road, Christian Life, that meets at crossroads that meets at Woodland Hills but there's one church because there's one savior one father one baptism okay and I love that and Paul prayed that regularly because you have to remember Paul went on missionary journeys to establish the church the church was born on the day of Pentecost and out of that begin to grow and flourish in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And then Paul had his conversion that we talked about last week. We did a little timeline history of Paul. And then he began to go and establish churches with other ministries and missionaries that would go with him. And so, of course, he's praying for the church for its unity. Because it's like his baby that the Lord's allowing him to partner with the kingdom of God to see released in the earth. And so one of Paul's prayers was praying for the unity in the church across a city or region. And I want to encourage you that when you pray for the church, don't just pray for Christian life because we can't do it all. We can't be all. Um, but guess what? The church in Columbia is thriving. It's growing. Disciples are being made. Lives are being transformed. In fact, I'll be at a prayer breakfast tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at First Baptist Church downtown with the group that we connect with called Pray Cola, which is Pray for Columbia. Cola, short for Columbia. And um, we do that quarterly where we come together and guess what? A bunch of pastors in a room, we worship together, adoration and praise. Then we pray together and we have people lead us in prayer over our city, over crime, over... Um, injustice over all the things that are wrong that we're wanting to change in Columbia and the greater metropolitan area which is close to 800,000 people now. When we started this in 2001 there was only half a million so we thought maybe we can knock this out but no y'all just keep growing and so we need more of the Lord we need more of the Lord's help and direction but Paul prayed for unity in the church and I want to encourage you to pray for unity in the church. In fact one of our um, prayer assignments is unity and reconciliation. Those 14 things we pray for regularly here at Christian Life. And that unity and reconciliation is for you and your life. It's for this church and this house. But it's also for the church in our city. That we would be reconciled to one another and we would be unified in Christ. Number six, 
Paul also prays in Romans 15, 13 for prayer to be filled with supernatural joy, peace, and hope. I'm telling you what, when I go to a prayer meeting and it is filled with supernatural joy, peace, and hope, the hours seem like minutes. But when I go to a prayer meeting and it's all about the devil did this and the devil did that and woe is me and we're doing this wrong and man, those minutes seem like hours. Paul understood something about the dynamic of supernatural things happening as we pray. He also knew something about the psychology of men and women. When we're in a positive atmosphere and we're asking God to do things that are bigger than we are, and he's inviting us into a preferred future where his glory reigns and where his power and authority rules over all. Man, the, min- the hours seem like minutes. And Paul understood that. Listen to this prayer in Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So you don't just say, oh, I got joy and peace. No. There's a joy and peace that comes that produces faith in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy and peace in faith produces hope. I was um, visiting patients yesterday at the hospital, which I do once a month. And I'm telling you, I I love doing that. I've done it for over a decade now. I have my 10-year pen from Lexington Medical Center. Uh, for visiting patients. I don't do it for that, but I do it because it gives me an outlet to people who are not a part of my church. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't join a bowling league. I'm not a sports kind of person, so I'm not coaching my kids' soccer team because they don't play soccer. So I had to find a fishing hole, if you will, to, to talk to people who were far from God because I'm not saying everybody who comes to Christian life is a Christian. I'm just saying I feel like I'm around believers 24-7. I work with them. I live with them. Um, I serve them and I serve with them. And I need an outlet to be with people who are far from God. And so going to the hospital once a month gives me a dose of reality and reminds me how much the world needs the Lord. But you know what? It also reminds me how much I need the Lord. But as I drive to the hospital each day that I'm to serve, I ask the Lord, give me a prayer for the patients today. What is on your heart for the men and women and children in this hospital today? And the Lord very clearly yesterday told me, when you pray for each patient today, you pray strength for today and hope for tomorrow. And I didn't even realize it. That's coming from a hymn. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. You know the song? That just erupted in my heart. And this is what Paul is saying. When we pray, we should ask the Lord to fill us with supernatural joy and peace. And the result of that is hope. Because people can live... What is it? A week without food or a month, three or four days without water, three, two or three minutes without air. But we can't live two seconds without hope. We need hope. Believers and unbelievers alike. So Paul tapped into something huge there, I believe. Number seven, prayer for Israel to be saved through Jesus. Again, I can't make this stuff up. We just had the prayer for Israel for the attack this past Saturday. I know we've been praying for Israel since October 6th, but just another opportunity for the Lord to show me, hey, you're you're on track. This is what I'm wanting my church to hear. But we need to pray for Israel to be saved through Jesus. I need to just say this quickly. I don't have a lot of time to deal with this, but national Israel is not saved because they're national Israel. They're only saved and come to the knowledge of the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. They will only be in heaven with us if they bow the knee to the Messiah, Jesus. 
uh, just because they're ethnically Jewish or just because they live in Israel does not make them uh, secure and guaranteed for heaven. And there are some people out there that teach that. And, and we don't teach and believe that. The Bible's very plain that we have to say yes to Jesus and have a relationship with him in order to spend eternity with the Father. But we pray for Israel to be saved uh, through Jesus. And we're praying that Zechariah 12, 10 prayer that they will look on the one whom they have pierced. And with prayers and supplication, they will repent. And in one day, Israel will be saved. I don't believe that's a literal day. I believe that God is saying in one big fell swoop, many men, women, boys and girls can come to the knowledge of faith in Christ Jesus because he will reveal himself to them. And that's the prayer we're praying. But Paul prayed, Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. And that's a good prayer for us to pray. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we need to also pray for the salvation of those who live in that city and in that country. So that's one of our prayer points here. Israel and the Middle East, you see it right back there on the wall. So pray that Israel might be saved. Number eight, prayer for the release of apostolic ministry and to abound in love and holiness. Paul prayed for apostolic ministry to be released. Why is that important? You've got the five-fold ministry. Apostles, prophets, pastors, or evangelists, pastors, teachers. I had to do my finger lesson here. Apostles, you remember apostles by the thumb because they touch every other gift and they connect and coordinate the others. That's why we need apostolic ministry because they go into an area, they see the need, and then they connect with pastors, evangelists, prophets, and teachers to establish the kingdom in those uh, areas that need Jesus. So Paul prays for this in 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 to 13. We rejoice for your sake before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 1 Thessalonians 9, 3, 9 to 13. So Paul is praying for that release of the apostolic ministry. And it's not just so the kingdom can be set up or the local church can be set up. That's a part of it, but that we would abound in love and holiness. If we abound in love and holiness, guess what? There's not going to be any barriers. There's not going to be any roadblocks for the kingdom and the church of Jesus Christ to be established in the areas where he is moving and where revival is touching hearts of those who are hungry and seeking him. Number nine, Paul prays for the release of the Holy Spirit's power unto mature holiness. Um, let me read the prayer and then I want to talk about this for a minute. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now, this is a prayer for the release of the Holy Spirit's power. Now, a lot of times when people pray that, they just stop there. I just want the power. I want the power that makes me speak another language that I haven't learned. I want the power that makes me fall on the floor. I'll never forget Jack Taylor talking about uh, a meeting he was in with, um, I can't remember what country it was, but it was so cute. He said they would come up and be prayed for and then they would fall down and then would go get back a line and come all the way up. So there was this continual line of people. And he said, what are you doing? They say, 
You pray, we fall down. You pray, we fall down. And that's, that's all they thought was supposed to happen. And he, he had to take, hey, whoa, 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 we got to stop. We got to have a teaching moment. It's not just about the power of God being manifest. That's important. In fact, uh, next week we'll talk about the importance of signs and wonders um, in Peter and John's prayer in Acts. We'll talk about that. There is a importance and a premium on that. But that's not the end goal. The end goal, read it with me, is unto mature holiness. That's the part we don't like. Because that's the part we have to rely on Holy Spirit to help us hold our tongue or cleanse our thoughts or keep us from going places we shouldn't go or doing things we shouldn't do or being with people we shouldn't be with. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to be mature holiness more, can I say, or or would would I be allowed to say, than we need a manifestation of God's power. I long for those times of God's presence when his power is manifest and the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear and the dead are raised. I long for that. I want to see that. I want to be a part of that. And there is a place for that in the kingdom. But can I tell you, there's not a place for it unless we are unto mature holiness. The Holy Spirit of God, we should ask to be released so that we can become the men and women of integrity, righteousness, purity, and holiness that he died for us to be. Jesus didn't die for us to be entitled to get what we want when we want it. He died for us to become men and women of faith and belief and conviction and morals and principles all founded in God's word which comes from Father's heart because that is his best for us. Let me say it again. I know I kind of touched on this in our prayer time tonight but we don't really have a problem with discerning good and evil. You and I, in our relationship with the Lord, have a problem with discerning good, better, and best. And God is always saying to us, here's my best. Here's my best. Here's my best. And we're saying, but Lord, I'll just take your good. Or I'll just take the better. I'll settle for the good. I'll settle for the better. And he's saying, no, I want you to have my best. And the enemy's keeping us and we're keeping us from unto mature holiness that this passage in Thessalonians is talking about. If I'm not careful here, I'm going to preach in a minute. Lord, keep me in the teaching lane. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay. To three of you, great. The rest of you, join me for the rest of it, okay? Okay. Let's look at the Christian life lessons. Ways to pray for the church using the apostolic prayers. It's one thing to learn the prayers and pray the prayers. But you and I need to know the why behind the what. And so over these next two sessions, this one and the next one, we're going to be looking at about 13 or so reasons that we should pray for the church using the apostolic prayers. We'll touch on seven of them in this session, and we'll touch on six of them in the next session as we finish out the prayers of Paul. So let's look at these. These should be listed in your notes, and I'll give you some scripture references to go with it if they're not there. Number one, why should we be praying for the church using these apostolic prayers? Number one, pray for the presence of God to be manifest in church services, and for people to be saved, set free, healed, and refreshed by the Holy Spirit during the worship, preaching, and ministry times. Now, I want to invite all of you, if you can, it might take 30 extra minutes of your Sunday morning. You might have to get up a little bit earlier. You might have to coordinate some things with your kids or grandkids or whatever your Sunday morning schedule looks like. But from 9 to 9.30, a brief 30-minute prayer service in the Brown Chapel, every Sunday we pray for the services. And I love it because we're praying in real time with what God is doing the moment we start praying. By the time we start praying, pastor is usually preaching in that first service. 
And so we're asking the Lord to begin to touch hearts, open eyes, let the anointing of God rest on pastor as he communicates the word of God and the heart of God. We pray for the volunteers who serve on Sunday. We pray for the worship teams. We pray for the altar ministry time. Lord, bring people to an encounter with you. May they leave different than when they came in. That 30-minute window is just a time of praying for what God wants to do in this house during that, those two services, 8.30 and 10 o'clock. And I want to invite you to come join us. There's usually about three to eight people in there. And I'd love to have 300 in there praying. Can you imagine the spiritual temperature in this house? The more people we get in the presence of the Lord, seeking God for his direction and his will. And I'm telling you, he's already doing, he's already honoring the little. He's already honoring the few that come on Sunday morning because he's doing in the services what we're praying in the prayer room. And that's the way it should be. Can I just be bluntly honest with you? We don't pray and go, well, I prayed. No, we pray because we want things to be different. We pray because we want to align ourselves with the Father. We pray because we want the heavenlies, the kingdom to come in the earth and be made manifest. And so Whatever we're praying in the prayer room is what's happening in the service. And that happens week after week after week. So if you want some of that action, I'm inviting you to come to the 9 o'clock prayer service. Oh, i got to hurry. Number two, pray that love will abound and that God's people will approve the things that God calls excellent. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. There's that word again. And may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Mature unto mature holiness, pure and blameless. Number three, pray that the anointing of conviction will rest on the preaching of the word so that both believers and unbelievers are impacted greatly. We don't just preach for the believer. We preach for the unbeliever as well. Why? John 16, 8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach us, or another translation says, prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And how many of you know believers and unbelievers alike can get it wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment? We need the Holy Spirit. And when we pray Philippians 1, 9, and 10, that stuff starts to happen. Number four, pray for a spirit or an attitude. When I say spirit, I'm not talking about a disembodied soul. I'm not talking about a demonic evil thing. I'm talking about an attitude. Okay. That's why it's lowercase s. If it's uppercase s, that is the spirit, Holy Spirit. Okay. But we're praying for a spirit or an attitude of holiness and love to prevail in the congregation. I'm telling you, if we begin to live holy lives and pure lives before the Lord, guess what? God's attracted to that. God will show up in our mess. But it's different when he shows up in our mess than when he shows up when we're hot on fire for him. Amazing things begin to happen. We begin to see things. We begin to understand things. There's a deposit and a download in us of a supernatural nature that we can't figure out with our own thinking and our own experience and our own grid of understanding. We've got to have the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens when we have an attitude of holiness and love prevailing in this church family, in this house. Number five, why do we pray using the apostolic prayers? Why do we pray for the church? Because we're praying for a great increase of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church and the manifestation of these gifts through words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits, healing, miracles, faith, messages in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. That's a whole nother lesson. And let me let you go to Pastor Glenn's teaching last summer 
on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Look at up in the archives and find that. It'll be worth your time. He gives some amazing spiritual, scriptural insight as well as some amazing personal experience and spiritual insight from his own life. So Pastor Glenn's teaching on the gifts of the Spirit last summer, I think it was July, that he did that. You want to check that out, and that'll help you understand number five if you're new to the Christian faith or you're new to Christian life. Number six, pray for a prophetic spirit to rest on preachers, worship teams, and ministry leaders according to Acts 2.17. Now, what's important about Acts 2.17? Well, it is the restatement of Joel 2, Joel's prophecy in the Old Testament, spoken by the prophet Joel, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams. That's Joel 2 being restated in Acts 2. And we're praying that that would happen on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, in life groups, in the mother's group on Tuesday morning. Anytime we gather in the name of Christ and put him first with praise and adoration and ask him to come and have his way, that's what we're wanting to happen. So we're praying for that prophetic spirit to rest on preachers, worship teams, and ministry leaders according to Acts 2 and, of course, Joel 2. Number seven. Pray that the Holy Spirit will open more doors to minister to unbelievers and that he will prepare them to receive the gospel. Colossians 4.3 And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pastor Corey just did a series on Colossians and he talked about Paul being in chains and writing to the church at Colossae. From Rome. Also, 2 Thessalonians 3 1. Pray for us, this is Paul, that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. I'm going to have to close pretty quickly with this. But please, if you're watching online or if you're here tonight, join us in session seven because next week, the first session of next week, will be prayer requests of Paul. And there's about five to eight, depending on how you study scripture. I'm looking through it now. But there's times when Paul himself requested for prayer. And these are two of those times. And we're going to go deeper into that um, next week in session seven. So I hope you'll join us for that.